Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. Um, my name is Ahmed Musa, and I'm a senior account executive at Deal on the mobility team. Um, we used to be called LegalPad, now we're called Deal Immigration. I'll tell you a little bit about that story as well as what we do. Um, and then uh, I'm hoping to walk you all through different uh, visa options for startup founders that want to relocate to the United States either permanently or just have the ability to travel here um, to meet with their investors, customers, uh, partners, folks like that. So um, LegalPad started uh, out of the accelerator Techstars in 2018. We went through the Seattle batch um, with a simple idea. Uh, we wanted to make sure that opportunity is accessible to anybody, no matter where they're born. And we realized that US immigration law is really biased in favor of large companies like Meta and Apple and Google. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had the same opportunity to, to compete here in the US. Um, one of our early clients was a guy named Alex Bouaziz. He's the CEO and founder of a company called Deal that was going through Y Combinator in winter 2019. Um, we got his O-1 visa. It's a very common work visa for startup founders. Um, had a really good partnership, worked really well. Uh, he liked the way that we do business and ended up acquiring us, which is super cool. So that's the kind of level of service you can expect in working with us. Uh, you don't want to buy us. Um, and so, yeah, all, all I do all day long is talk to startup founders uh, about two things. One, how to get a visa or green card for themselves. And two, how to get visas and green cards for their employees. Um, and so what I wanna do today is focus on the most common visa that we do for startup founders. Um, I wanna be clear, this is not the only one that we do. Uh, it just tends to be the preferred option. Um, and that is the O-1 visa. So the O-1 is a work visa that allows a company registered in the United States to hire somebody to come to the US and work for them here. And the reason why founders like it is one, there's no lottery basis. So if you want to build your business in America, you probably don't want to have to rely on winning a lottery like the H-1B requires. Second, there's no prevailing wage requirement, which means there's no minimum salary that you have to pay yourself in order to maintain your visa, which is another advantage over the H-1B. Uh, third, you can renew your O-1 visa indefinitely. Uh, the initial visa is valid for three years. And at the end of that three-year period, you can renew it or extend it every one to three years again and again and again. And finally, if you want to apply for a green card at some point, because you like it here and you want to make the U.S. your home, there's an almost one-to-one -one overlap in the requirements between an O-1 visa and most green card options. Um, and so uh, if you have an O-1 approved, you can be very confident that your green card application will be successful either right after your O-1 approval or after you do some things to strengthen your, o uh, your, your green card profile. Um, so I'm going to focus on the O-1 specifically today, um, but I've shared my email here on this uh, slide and my LinkedIn as well. I'm super responsive. So if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to hop on a call to talk about your specific uh, immigration options. Um, happy to do like a free assessment, figure out, you know, is the O-1 or is there a different visa that's better for you based on your personal or professional goals? Uh, walk you through the process, the requirements. If you're eligible, awesome. We can walk through what the next steps would look like. Uh, if you're not quite eligible yet, uh, then um, me and my team are more than happy to help provide the information necessary to kind of get you to where you need to be to apply. And we do all that for free. Uh, we, we don't charge, we don't sign any letters, uh, engagement letters, nothing, until we are super confident we have a path forward uh, and we believe that you are uh, eligible. Um, so that being said, let's dig into the O-1. So uh, the O-1 uh, is reserved for people that the US government believes have extraordinary abilities in their field. So if you're a founder, you're basically having to show the government that you are the Olympic equivalent of somebody in your space. Um, and the way that the government assesses eligibility is they look at eight criteria and a successful petition satisfies at least three out of those eight criteria. 
Um, and if you're a venture-backed startup founder, you probably satisfy at least three, maybe four or five, just based on you having raised venture capital. Um, here's why. So the first thing that the government looks at is awards. They want to know whether you have ever won any prestigious awards for work that you've done. Um, if you've ever won like any hackathons, or pitch competitions that were really competitive, that's super relevant here. If you've ever won like a, you know, you were named like Forbes 30 under 30 or something like that, that could be relevant here. But if you've raised venture capital, we can also frame that as an award. And the reason why is blue chip VCs get pitched all the time on various, uh, you know, startup ideas. They put them through a very rigorous due diligence process. And on the other end of it, they award a select few um, an investment. And so we've had a lot of success showing that anything north of 500,000 US dollars in venture capital raised uh, could be a compelling argument for the awards category. And this doesn't have to be 500K from one VC. This could be a cumulative 500K. And you can get away with less. You know, we've done, we've, we've done cases for a lot less. It just tends to be like 500K in the thousand plus O1s that we've done to date. Uh, seems to be like that's the magic number that, that typically is a strong argument. Um, the second criteria that the government looks at is memberships. They want to know whether you've ever joined an organization where you've gone through a very selective process to become a member. And this could mean all sorts of things. Um, but if you're a startup founder and you've ever gone through a, an accelerator or an incubator that was competitive, that could be, uh, oh, uh, do, do, do. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not changing slides. Uh, I'm just leaving it for one, thanks. <laughs> um, so the second thing the government looks at is uh, memberships. And for founders, that tends to be um, like an accelerator or an incubator that's competitive tends to be a pretty strong argument for the membership criteria. So that would be like your Y Combinators, your Techstars, your Antlers, um, Mass Challenge, Berkeley Skydeck, if you're in the US. These are all uh, a surge. Miracle Plus in China. Um, these are all good examples of an uh, organization that would satisfy the membership criteria because lots and lots of people apply to join these organizations and then very few are selected. Um, and you can see how the awards and membership criteria kind of coincide, right? If you go through Y Combinator, they're going to invest $500,000 into your business and suddenly you have two criteria, right? Awards because of the venture capital raised through them and second, uh, memberships just because you are participating in their uh, in their accelerator program. Um, the third criteria the government looks at is press. Um, and for press, the government wants to see that you have uh, generated media coverage that mentions your name. Um, and so, you know, in the US, top tier firms would be, or publications would be like New York Times, Bloomberg, TechCrunch, Wired, uh, Forbes, Business Insider. Um, but, you know, press in your home country could be relevant as well. Um, we're just shooting for like real press with a real author with a real byline. Um, that's what we want to see for that. And, you know, you can always buy press, right? We don't want you to like pay for like sponsored content, but you can always hire a PR firm and they're usually able to get you media coverage. Um, so you put some of those VC dollars to work. Um, and you can see how you can kind of like hack the O1 process. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the criteria the government looks at is uh, critical employment. And for critical employment, the government wants to see that you've held a cr uh, high level position at a company with a distinguished reputation. And if you're the founder of a company, um, you're probably pretty important. And if you've raised venture capital or have revenue and you have media coverage and you've gone through a prestigious accelerator, these are all examples of evidence that we can use to show that your company has some merit or is distinguished. Um, and allows us to make that critical employment argument. So, you know, again, if you are a founder and you go through a prestigious accelerator, that could potentially be memberships. If they give you money or you raise money after the program, after like a demo day, that can help you with the awards criteria. And then because you've done, uh, because you raised money and you've gone through a prestigious accelerator, you're probably in a good position to get media coverage about your company or about your work. And now that's the three criteria that you need for the O1. And then you can um, take all those things together to show that your company is uh, distinguished 
And because you're the founder, you're you playing a important role there, and now suddenly you've unlocked a fourth criteria. So if you're a VC-backed founder, it's pretty easy to hack the O1 process. Um, and that's one reason why so many founders uh, prefer to apply for the O1. Um, again, we do lots of other types of visas and green cards. It's, this is just the one that most people prefer. Um, the way that we work is you would schedule a call with me or somebody on my team. We'd hop on, we'd ask you some questions about these criteria and the other uh, three that the government looks at when they, or four that the government looks at when they assess eligibility. And uh, we would see, you know, if you're good to go, great. If so, we'll walk you through next steps. If not, we'll provide you very specific guidance on how you can strengthen your case before applying. Um, and uh, we have a team of attorneys that will collect your evidence from you uh, and build build uh, the strongest possible case. Um, total timeline usually takes like around four months, depending on bandwidth. Um, for us, you know, step one is we collect all of your information via our web app. Um, most people take about a week to get us everything that we ask for. Um, once we have everything that we need from you, we will then assign one of our attorneys. They'll take a week or two to review everything with a fine tooth comb. Um, they'll hop on a call with you to discuss case strategy. They'll ask you some questions, they'll ask them some questions, and we'll develop the narrative that we're going to tell the government. Um, and once we have everything we need and we have a clear path forward, um, I don't know, it usually takes about eight weeks or so to prepare a case. We file it with the government and they guarantee to respond within two weeks. So it's pretty quick. Um, once your O1 is approved, uh, you'll then make an appointment with the U.S. consulate in your home country. You'll go to an interview. They'll ask you some questions on your petition. Make sure that you are the person on the, on the file. Uh, and then um, they'll give you a stamp. You can use that to travel to the U.S. And again, your visa is valid for an initial period of three years and can be renewed every one to three years thereafter forever. Um, if you're married and or have children, your uh, your spouse and any children will automatically qualify for the O3 dependent visa. That will allow them to travel to the United States with you. Um, the O3 allows them to live in America, go to school in America, travel to and from the country independently from you. Um, it does not give your spouse the ability to work, but it does not prevent them from applying for their own separate work visa once they're here and they find an employer willing to sponsor their visa. That's that's pretty much what I've got for you. Um, we do lots of different types of visas in the U.S., um, but if you're interested in uh, getting access to live or work in any other country anywhere in the world, we do support immigration in 30 plus countries and counting. Um, so the U.K. is one example. Uh, a lot of our uh, clients choose to move to like Dubai, uh, which has some really cool and uh, tax free uh, visa options. Um, the Netherlands is typically pretty easy to get to. This is a Europe-centric uh, audience, though, I guess. So uh, I'll leave it at like Canada, the US, Dubai. Those are all really um, popular examples, not only for founders, um, but also for uh, their employees, right? A lot of companies uh, lately have been hiring people and then giving them um, visa sponsorship abroad. It's kind of a benefit um, to help people not only get a job, but maybe give a better life uh, to their employees. Um, in a country where there might be more opportunity for themselves or for their children. Uh, and so it's, you know, I'm super stoked and excited and, and honored to be able to support that here at Deal. Um, and that's all I've got for you. Thanks everybody so much for your time.